I hope you enjoyed your lunch and um, you've enjoyed the, the event so far. I found it really fascinating and it's uh, been really interesting to hear about Half Double and, and really in, in many ways I've seen so many connections with the work that we've been doing in the UK over the last 10, 15 years on mega projects and how you bring innovation into mega projects. Um, mega projects um, actually has been, the, the whole field of mega projects has been really developed uh, by Bent Fliefberg. Fliefberg. I'm not very good with my Danish, so I do apologize. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he's done a fantastic job of really developing the area uh, and actually works in, in, the, in the UK in the Said uh, Business School. Uh, where he's really pioneered a lot of work in, 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 in uh, mega projects. Um, so what he defines as a mega project is something which is a billion dollars or more. And that goes back a few years now, but that's kind of the regular uh, type of scale that we're talking about. Uh, and mega projects are full of uncertainties, full of risks and full of complexities. So one of the big challenges in mega projects is really how do you actually embrace that uncertainty? How do you deal with uncertainty? And especially given the long duration of a mega project, many of them have long planning periods and they go on for 10 years. They take 10 years to develop. So how could you possibly predict and identify all of the th sort of risks that might happen, all of the, um, the events that might happen 10 years in advance? So within a mega project, it's really important uh, in the recent research uh, that we've found to actually have a th an innovative structure a flexible structure and a structure that allows for learning. So you need, because you can't predict what will happen so many years in advance, you need to have uh, the ability to bring in new innovations, new technologies that might happen during the life of the project. The ability to be flexible and adaptive, as you've talked about, again, connecting to the, the half-double methodology, uh, and, the bit of, and the ability to learn, learning both internally and externally benchmarking, looking at other industries, other projects, to work out how you can uh, can, can deliver these. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is really the research that I've been doing on London's mega projects over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and I've been working up, many of these projects are massive in scale, certainly in, in terms of their uh, the, the overall figures, they're well over a billion dollars, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, they're large, they're complex, uh, and what we've seen is a radical shift in the UK in that period, since about 2003, where there's been a new way of delivering mega projects. Um, and I want to talk about that uh, today, this afternoon, um, because in the past, innovation was something, no, we must avoid innovation. Innovation is associated with a risk. Innovation, the ability to bring new ideas is a cost. And what we're finding now is that in these projects, they're actually saying, let's embrace innovation. Innovation is the way to deal with the uncertain, all right? So it's a kind of a really big mind shift for people in mega projects where the, the standard way of working was very much, let's have a fixed price, let's try to identify all of the possible uncertainties, we'll, um, we'll account for those in a fixed price contract, uh, and we'll rely on established techniques. There's been a big shift in the UK, a move away from that kind of traditional model to a new model which really allows for um, uh, complexity, uh, uncertainty, and so on, okay? So it's a, this is a kind of a fundamental shift, really, that we've seen. Um, what I want to do is go through, I'll, I'll do a little bit of context, I'll, give you, I'll talk a little bit about London's uh, mega projects, some of the works, I'll talk about three. In fact, we, we, over the years, we've been involved in about uh, six or seven of these projects in different ways. But I'll introduce three where we've had a kind of a, just to give you a flavor of what the scale of these projects are. Uh, and, it, and you have to, to sort of understand that these projects are broken down, decomposed into smaller projects. So a lot of the, uh, you know, you've got to think of it as a program with many different projects. And, uh, and many of these methodologies we've been talking about could apply at the level of the individual project within the program. So, it's, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ways of thinking about how your, your, what you've been talking about today uh, and, and the, the research and the work that's been done over the last few years could really apply to these types of projects. Then I'll, I'll talk briefly about the new delivery model that I, I spoke about. Then what I want to do is identify five rules, and we've talked a bit, quite a bit about simplicity. Pear talked about it, uh, Michael talked about it, and others have talked about it. And what I want to do is identify five simple rules for bringing innovation into projects and managing complexity, dealing with uncertainty. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we'll end by thinking about the implications for projects and how some of the things that I've said might apply to your projects as well. Okay. 
So let's look at London's large uh, uh, projects, uh, the ones that I've been involved in. Just as a bit of background, um, in, since two 2010, there's been 4,500 government projects in the UK. In the next 10 years, it's going to be 600 billion pounds worth investment in projects. So the UK is, is, a, is a site where a lot of, you know, there's a lot of investment in new infrastructure going on. Uh, and that's because, in part because of the need for any economy to upgrade its infrastructure over, over certain periods of time. But it's also a particular context of the UK where we've got aging Victoria, Victorian infrastructure uh, and there's a real need to replace that. So there's a kind of a, a, a real focus on infrastructure investment in the UK. Uh, and that's particularly evident in London where everything really happens. Uh, and because it's in a major city, a global city, delivering these projects is even more complicated because you've got you know, you're a live, living city and projects are being delivered in the middle of those cities with all the kind of the possibilities of disruption. People get accidents through, um, uh, uh, through uh, numerous lorries being, with bringing deliveries and so on to these sites. All of this has to be considered, um, uh, as well as the sheer scale of these things. Um, okay, so let's look at um, three projects to give you an illustration of the kind of complexity and scale that we're talking about here. This is the Heathrow Terminal 5 project. Probably many of you have been through that. That is the, um, Brit the hub for British Airways. 30 million passengers move through this, um, uh, this, this terminal. And this was a really key project. A lot of the transformation of the way we think about uh, mega projects and how they're delivered started with this project. They spent many years planning for the project uh, and recognized that they couldn't do things the old way this had to be done differently. So they created a new contractual approach, they created a, a way of collabor collaborating and working in integrated project teams, and they brought in lots of ideas from other industries, from the car industry just in time, from the aerospace industry, digital technologies and modeling, uh, from the North Sea oil and gas industry, they brought in um, modularity, prefabrication. Because if you think about an airport like this, there was only one entrance, a very limited point of access for workers, 8,000 workers coming in at any particular time. And it's a bit analogous to a North Sea oil and gas platform where you have to have, you know, you have to have, it's very difficult to deliver those things and construct them on a limited site. So there was a lot of learning from other industries. And the oil, oil and gas industry was really crucial because they used a great deal of prefabrication, modular components, so that they could easily be assembled on site. Um, when this project started, there was a massive um, planning inquiry. It went on for many years, and it, it was the longest planning inquiry in UK history. Um, and during that period, when they were designing this building, um, they basically um, they spent many, several years designing it, and there were all sorts of uncertainties that were happening in the uh, airport industry, in the airline industry. The airline industry is a very dynamic industry, as we heard to some extent earlier with um, the SAS, the SAS team, talking about the luggage, even at that level. These things are quite difficult to, to manage. And this was a time when they were planning and the government approval came in November 2001. Um, and there were all sorts of things that happened. 9-11 happened in September that year. So the, the design and security regime had to be reconfigured. That was something they hadn't um, anticipated during the planning period. Low budget airlines were coming in. These were all things that would affect the way in which they managed this, this project. Um, and, and they, fortunately, they thought about this a lot and they really worked hard on this and actually said that we've got to do this differently. So this was, I think, an interesting project. Um, uh, 4.3 billion, sorry, I should have said this was a 4.3 billion pound project. And it was, it was constructed from 2002 to 2008. It was, talking about, you know, the idea of focusing on particular projects. The way they run these projects is they run them as single project organizations. So the team is dedicated and they only work on that project with a project director for the duration of that project. So they get focus. They're not distracted at all and they have overall uh, corporate um, uh, kind of support as a separate organization. And this body was the um, BAA, British Airports Authority, set up a, temp a separate temporary project organization just for the duration of this project to deliver it. Um, there were, it was, the project was, just to give you a sense of the scale, there were 16 major projects. One of those projects alone was 300 million, the, um, the Piccadilly line to, to the airport. So that in itself was almost a mega project. So it's a program of almost mega projects in scale. Uh, really um, fascinating. And then it was divided into 147 sub-projects. 
BAA was the main client body. There were 300 people. So it was a big client organization working in that to manage that. And they had anything between 60 and 80 first year suppliers. So that just gives you a sort of flavor of one project and the kind of uncertainties. There were things that happened during the project, like heavy rains that delayed construction. These things are sort of predictable, but when they happen, it's a, it's a nightmare. It really kind of messes up the project. Okay, the second one. This is the second one that we worked on. And we were, as a team, we, I was working at Imperial College and then I moved on to UCL, but worked with the same people. We were deeply involved in the senior level with these projects. And here you see um, a project similar in uncertainty. Uh, it was a 6.8, it came in its um, 6.8 billion construction project um, for the London Olympics. It wasn't just for the Olympics and the Paralympics, it was also for leaving a legacy in London. So this area is one of the poorest boroughs and regions of London. And the idea is to leave, have an impact, talking about impact, by having a, leaving a legacy. So right from the beginning of the project, they were talking about how do we leave a legacy here. And you see many of the venues are, are um, on, on this um, photograph here. We have the, um, uh, in, the, in the distance you have the Olympic Stadium, you have the um, Aquatic Centre, the Velodrome and other things. And one of the things about big projects is not just uncertainty, things that you can't predict, it's actually how you manage complexity. There were multiple subsystems and systems that had to be integrated. This is, all of these projects are systems of systems projects. And, and because you've got to deal with multiple interfaces, they had to have interface management between all of these different systems to fit it together. And that in itself generates uncertainty as well. When you try to fit these things together, it's difficult. And they had 70 major projects. Each project had its own contractor and its own supply chain. And then there was an overall uh, client body called the Olympic Delivery Authority working with a delivery partner. And a new way of delivering these models is to have a client, a fairly big client body, uh, which has got lots of capability in-house, working with delivery partners. And the delivery partner manages the overall program, whereas the individual systems, if you like, the stadium, the velodrome and all of those, will have their own contractor. So they kind of have loose, tight management across the overall program uh, in, in this way. The, the key thing here, unlike uh, the other projects, is time and pace it was really important to the Olympics. So this was driven by an immovable deadline and that, man, that set the culture, the tone, everything about this project right from word go. Um, and that's the um, stakeholder map. We've been talking about stakeholders. This is from the, um, there were 700 stakeholders that they had to manage. Of course, they had to bear in mind that the main stakeholder is the, um, was the uh, department responsible for the project and the um, International Olympic body uh, overseeing it. But you, at the same time, as well as managing multiple interfaces internally, there's all these external interfaces. And that's partly connected to the idea that you're doing these projects in, um, in a city, in a, comp in a very busy area. Okay, third one. Anybody heard of that project? Crossrail. So that one was 6.8, this last one. The first one was 4.3. This one is 14.8 billion. And at the moment, this is the biggest civil engineering project in Europe. Um, and it has a similar kind of structure. It's got a, a, a client body, Crossrail Limited, with it, which is you know, about 250 people. They have two delivery partners helping them manage the program because it's such a complex um, set of activities. Um, and this is the breakthrough. This is, the, this is their big moment in these projects. Tunneling, it really matters. This is, a, this is their technology, their baby. Uh, and they celebrate these. As like a, you know, it looks almost like a, kind of a painting from the Middle Ages you know, to some extent. But, uh, uh, but this is the breakthrough. The, this is Liverpool Street. This is the tunneling machine going through at Liverpool Street. All right? I just wanted to give you a flavor that before we get into the details of the, of the projects. And that's, that's, that's what it is. It basically goes east, west, approximately, across London and underneath London. This is an urban railway system. Uh, and uh, so there's 21 kilometers of tunnels going underneath L London. And at, at the closest point, um, one, of those, one of the crossrail tunnels is only 37 centimeters from a London underground tunnel, the northern line. So this is a live tunnel and they had to manage and coordinate that and they've obviously done this with digital technologies and techniques and so on. Um, so it's, it's actually two tunnels of 21 kilometers, two twin bore tunnels running underneath London. Um, and this is, these are my photographs actually when I was on site because um, it's quite near where we work and we had a site visit. Um, this is Tottenham Court Road. So this is the, you know, the West End near Tottenham Court Road junction with Oxford Street. 
very, very busy. Imagine all of the, ish, the challenges that the, the, the um, constructors had on this site. So building a, you know, building a new station. And below ground, and the station itself is 250 metres. So it's the length of Wembley Stadium, Wembley Football Stadium, below ground, 24 metres below ground. They have to bring all of the workers in, all of the materials, all of the techniques underground at that, at that level. So um, that just gives you a, another flavour of, um, of kind of, a, of, of, of what, what, we, what we're looking at. In that station alone, when the, um, when the um, Crosswell opens, there'll be 200,000 200, passengers a day going through that station. Um, and, uh, and the actual uh, Crossrail as an urban railway system will add 10% to London's transportation capacity in, overnight when it opens in 2018, 2019. So what we've been talking about are mega projects. And this is again, these $1 billion, pound, uh, uh, $1 billion projects. Um, they're important in general, not just in London, globally. McKinsey um, estimate that 57 trillion is going to be invested in infrastructure between 2013 and, tw and 2030. Much of that, the delivery model for doing that is a mega project. So mega pro getting mega projects right is really important um, as, as an activity. And I actually think, I mean, having listened to what I've heard, I've heard today, they could really benefit from the method of half, half half double methodology, particularly in the, in the different levels, the different, when you break them down, decompose them to their different parts, this methodology could really apply. Perhaps also at a kind of program level as well, but that's something we can think about. Um, right, so the systems of systems, they're uncertain, you know, there's, uh, there are certain things at the beginning of a project that you can, you can predict, you can work out and actually do a risk register, but there are many things you can't predict, and that's really what I want to talk about today. What we found in these projects is that they are trying to be adaptive, trying to address, embrace uncertainty using your um, using the half double methodology, um, and and take that on board. In the past, that didn't really happen. This is a new way of thinking for big projects. The bigger the project, the more risk averse they are. They really are, and it's very difficult to change the mindset of people in this. Um, I've talked about the busy urban context. They're trans transformational. They change cities, so they are really important. Um, in, the, in the UK, they, you know, the government talks about them being too big to fail. Um, and yet, this is the figures from Bent Fleetberg, 9 out of 10, so only 10% success rate. So the opportunities to improve productivity, to improve performance in this sector is enormous. Um, and that failure rate applied particularly badly to the UK until recently. We've, you know, in the UK, we've done very, very uh, poorly. Um, and I just want to give you a bit of that. So. Let's look at the, let's, sorry, just go back there. So let's look at the new pr delivery model, but in order to explain it, I just wanted to say a few words about what it was like before, so that you've got a sense of what we're moving from, what was the old model and where we're moving to. Uh, and then you can see how the innovation is being brought and the new approach is being brought into this, this kind of thinking. So these are just four projects and there could, I could have given you many more. The Channel Tunnel was one year late and one billion over budget. So this is a poor, poor track record. Wembley Football Stadium, it depends when you judge the original bid and the, what, the, what they originally planned for, but that was over 300 million over budget and three to four years late. Yeah. Uh, it was to the original bid. Uh, the original bid was, sorry, it was came in about 700 million, so the original was just under three, it was under, you know, three, around 300, but it, it's three, 400, but it kind of varied, you know, it depends on what, baseline where you, where you take the baseline for the actual bid. If you look at the bid documentation, if we can see it, it's, it goes back a, a fair bit, yeah. Um, Scottish Parliament building, that the original um, estimates, because they, they vary the estimates with between 10 and 40 million, that came in um, over 400 million. So that was 1,600% over budget. So we, Houston, we have a little bit of a problem here. Um, we have to start getting this right. The Jubilee line is another one, which there was a lot of learning from Crossrail. That came in about 1.5 billion over budget. That was just about on time. It, it was delayed by three years, but it only came in, it was, it was supposed to be ready for the Millennium celebrations, linking it to the Millennium Dome, and it was just about on time, just about open on time. It should have been three years earlier. So these are projects just about on time. Okay. That just gives you a flavor. So government reports um, uh, have really investigated what was going wrong. People have thought about this in projects deeply. 
studied what's going on at the National Audit Office, um, the Egan Review, uh, the Latham Report. These are industry, um, uh, industry and government reports in the UK. I've all found that these, this, we've got to know why these projects are going wrong and we've got to start getting it right. Um, and so fixed price contract, all of them use a fixed price contract. And that assumes that the uncertainties that you are likely to face can be embodied in a contract at a particular moment in time. And imagine, in 10 years time, how can we possibly predict everything that's gonna happen in the contract? And so a lot of work in the early days was done on the contract, but it's not just about the contract. A lot of the original model was because of the, partly in part because of the contract, but was adversarial. Uh, it, it was of arm's length, you know, this is your responsibility. We've given you Mr. Prime Contractor or Miss Prime Contractor the risk here. Um, it's your responsibility when it goes wrong. But none of the contractors have got the kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of resources to pay for the kind of overruns that are likely to happen in these projects and do happen. Um, and there was a big issue around avoiding innovation. Innovation simply was not seen to be the thing to, to focus on. Innovation, as I said earlier, seemed to be a cost, something to, to be avoided. And this is um, Andy Mitchell, the program director, who's very in favor of innovation, by the way. Um, says, when it comes to innovative ideas on major projects, the natural state of mind is to control risk by using the tried and tested. To actually just, let's rely on our existing routines, uh, let's fix the price, and maybe we'll be lucky. But, you know, 90% of the times, it hasn't happened. Um, so, there are two things that happened in the UK that really started to change the rules of the game. The first one was um, a new contract. Um, and this was on the um, Terminal 5 project. The contract was developed in the late 1990s. Uh, the, con the actual construction work in started in 2002, uh, but they decided to have a completely different type of contract. They said, actually, we'll have a, a flexible contract. It was cost reimbursable. So the teams would be reimbursed their costs, and there was an incentive pot to, you know, to incentivize them. And if they actually performed very well, they would share that money, that, you know, that pot that was set aside. Uh, and so there was all sorts of efforts to work out what the target costs were and what kind of incentive pot they should be. So they were encouraged to ex identify risks, actively encouraged uh, and, and, and supported when they did to develop them and they would be rewarded for doing that. Um, and they were also, it wasn't just about risk and risk registers, they had um, opportunity res registers. So they would recognize um, opportunities. Uh, you know, they would look for opportunities that might happen. New materials, new technologies and so on during the life of the project, new techniques. And many new techniques, as I said earlier, were brought into this project from, the, um, from other industries like Just In Time and the car industry and so on. This project was really trans transformational. It started to sh take, sh reshape the way people on projects thought about how we deliver projects. Um, uh, and um, that learning was transferred to other projects. So learning began to be carried forward. Other people, pe senior people on these projects moved on to other projects. Major contractors moved on to other projects. So, for example, uh, Lang O'Rourke and Mace were the two biggest contractors on this project. They moved on and became the delivery partners on the Olympics. They played the, the, the T5 card. We've been on this project, this project was fantastic. And they, went, they, they became the client's preferred delivery partners on the Olympics. Uh, and then we've seen it further on. The, the, um, the uh, project director was Andrew Rosenholm on this project. He became the chief executive on Crossrail. You see a kind of circulation of people, so the learning starts to transfer across and between projects. Um, so, and one way they, they kind of uh, talk about this in the, um, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the company was just a way of characterizing it. Under the traditional arrangement, the client dumps the risk and expects the contractor to actually deal with the risk that's been transferred. So you see these kind of relationships, traditional contracting that I've already spoken about. Under the new relationship, and this is very unusual, this hasn't actually been repeated, the client said, we're gonna bear the risk. Ultimately, if the airport's late, it's our risk. So how can we possibly transfer the risk onto a contractor? We have to own that risk. Um, uh, and it, but it's the, it's the working relationships that are so different. Here now, under the T, what was called the T5 agreement, because it's an agreement to work with the contractors and the supply chain in a new kind of way, in a new collaborative way, um, you've got these kind of partnerships, different kind of contracts, uh, but it was very difficult to do. So on the um, Heathrow Terminal 5 project, the project director said, you wouldn't believe the kind of the change program that we had to implement here to change behaviors. Uh, it was like, he said it was almost like a hundred years of behavior that we had to change. Um, and that was 
the construction industry was very you know adversarial it's your risk this is not our risk and so on um, and he reckoned even though they worked really hard on this project to change behaviors only one third got the changes one third thought they got it so one, one third were really did work in the new way lang uh, lang o'rourke and mace for example two contractors one third thought they got it uh, but they didn't, and one, th one third of the contractors of the supply chain just didn't want to get it. So changing behaviours in these big projects is really difficult, especially in this industry. Um, uh, and don't, I wouldn't underestimate that. I mean, that's the kind of experience that we've, we've got. Okay, um, and the other big ch rule, change in the rules of the game was Andrew Wolstenholme, when he went from T5 to Crossrail, he said, actually, what we need to do in this project, instead of just you know, assuming that we've got the spec design specifications right at the beginning, let's actually have a, 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 a strategy for innovation during the life of the project. So we can actually actively encourage people within the project from the different teams to submit ideas to improve the performance of the project. So there's, this is a world's first, this didn't happen. And this was something that I worked with them doing um, action research, you know, we were talking about this before, where universities actively work with the projects in a more engaged way to actually solve problems that they face. And, they hadn't done anything like this before and they turned to us and we helped them do it. We worked with a team of people in the project. And you can see there's a McKinsey report on this. The message was sent out to the industry. We must innovate, we must bring innovation into these types of projects. Um, the new thinking has started to spread. Um, one thing I should say about the new thinking is that it really, in this kind of industry, it really does depend on a, a, a enlightened, big client organization that leads the process. So the clients in the UK have taken a, a big you know, role in actually driving innovation and driving the narrative of change, of, of doing something differently. Um, uh, you know, and this is you know, the Department for Transport, um, the, uh, the major projects like Crossrail and uh, the Olympics and so on. Okay. The key thing though is what, and all of these reports talk about it, how can we bring innovation, new ideas, new practices, new technologies, even new organizational forms, new ways of working, new contracts into these projects to, uh, to deliver them more efficiently and effectively. Um, and that's uh, something that we'll talk about now. Okay, so what I wanna talk about, and, and this is what you've, I think you've got the sheet of paper on your um, uh, seat, um, are five rules for managing large complex projects. And one thing that we learned from when we were doing the, our work was a, a book and, and, and several articles by Kathy Eisenhart and Donald Sell, where they say when you're in a, a kind of fairly stable environment, um, uh, you know, it's a kind of factory, Neil's, your, you know, the old days of the stable, you know, we're going to do these things under factory conditions. This is a stable environment. You can actually have quite complicated strategies, which, you know, could take a little bit of time to implement. But when you work in a project society, in a world driven by multiple projects, rapid change and uncertainty, you need simple rules, things that are kind of easily distillable, which is, again, why I like the half double one page, because it's kind of, an, and what I heard about just breaking it down into the three core components, actually, really does, is helpful. And they argue that this is the way things get done under very difficult conditions, where you need to make sharp judgments or need to have things that can help you see clearly through a lot of mess of different challenges, different pressures and so on, especially which happens so often in a project environment. Uh, so I want to distill uh, five rules um, and we've, looked, we've broken that up into, um, uh, and, you know, so the rules kind of connect to each other and you'll see that as I talk about them. But these are rules that we identified from working with the, the major projects in London over, 10 year, over a 13 year period. And we actually worked with the senior managers in the projects to sort of see, have we distilled the rules correctly? We went back to them and they gave us feedback on what the rules are. So they've been kind of fairly worked through. Okay. Did, I, did you miss the photograph? Oh, sorry, I'll go back. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, the first rule, and they're all rules for dealing with large complex projects, but we think they may have applic applicability to all types of projects, is assess what's worked before. Very simple didn't happen in the past. The people were simply weren't doing this. So learn externally, learn internally from your own experiences. Evaluate risk and uncertainty during the life. So it could be during the planning phase, but it, it's an ongoing process. It can be through execution as well. Uh, and the practice is, it, take, it takes investment, it takes time. So, you know, you have to go and do this, but it will pay off, it, sh it will be worthwhile. So site visits, and, and this meant literally going around the world, in this case, to look at other airports. Uh, to recruit relevant expertise, uh, very, very important. 
And I just wanted to give you an example of what happened at Terminal 5. When they, in order, before they delivered, and they said, we need a new delivery strategy, because if we do it the old way, it's simply going to be late. It's going to be over budget. So they, they took learning from the North Sea oil and gas industry, the car industry, the just-in-time just in techniques, uh, the aerospace industry, nuclear power. They had their own projects where, you know, the Heathrow Express project, which went badly wrong. And that used, the t that used the fixed price contract, All of, made all the traditional mistakes. They thought, we can't do that again. We've got our own internal experience where it went wrong. Other airports. Um, they actually did, actively did, and, then, and Ben Fliebberg, Fliebberg would be very happy because they did reference class forecasting, a form of that. They looked at every international airport that had opened over the past 15 years. Uh, and they looked at every major project in the UK, every mega project in the UK over the past 10 years. Uh, and they found out that if they did it the traditional way, which is fixed price, risk transfer, the, the project would be one billion over budget and one year late and there'd be six deaths. And that is, this is a private company because it had been privatized, remember? And they said, we can't be, we, we will go out of business if we're one billion, you know, because they can't rely on the government anymore to bail us out. So they had to, they simply couldn't do this. And that's why they invested so much in the delivery strategy in creating this more collaborative, innovative approach. Um, okay, so that, I mean, and this learning applies to, in every, uh, in every, under many of the rules, you'll see learning as a kind of a subtext term. Okay, rule two, um, organize for the unforeseen. And this is where I think it really hits, you know, you know resonates with half double. You embrace uncertainty, uncertainty will happen. So rather than hide it and ignore it and think it won't happen, try to wish it away as happened in the past, you need to create adapt adaptability, an adaptive organization, flexible processes for dealing with things when they happen so that you can deal with those events and uncertainties uh, and so on. And what we identified was certain practices associated with that, like the flexible contracts, which I've already spoken about, uh, where you're sharing risks and rewards. Uh, so you, if you want people to be incentivized to identify risk in a project and identify opportunity, you need to reward them for that as well. And they shouldn't be penalized for spending time doing that uh, and, and working collaboratively. Um, and here you've got, um, this is the, so the, 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 the you know, there was, a, there was a contract, but it really the contract wasn't the key thing. It was actually the processes, the way in which people collaborated. And this is just some words from the, um, the T5 agreement. That there was a handbook going alongside the, uh, the contract which talks about many of the things we've talked about today. Flexibility and adaptability are key objectives. These, are, these were kind of things that couldn't be said in the past. Conventional processes and solutions are simply not tenable. We need a flexibility of approach, flexibility of solutions. This is in a mega project, you know, a 4.3 billion pound project. And they're saying, actually, we need to, we, we must recognize the kind of world we face is something that we can't always anticipate. And we simply can't pass off the risk. Um, I'll give you an example here. Um, this is the air traffic control tower, um, which is all part of the project. In itself, was a big, you know, it was a very big, um, you know, sub project within the overall uh, within the overall uh, T5 project. Um, and when they looked at that, they said, "Well, this is a busy airport. It's a live airport, so we can't um, have, you know, the conventional way of building a, an air traffic control tower is to have deliveries and supplies continuously of concrete, pour, you know, coming in. So you pour, they make the, the construction. They said we can't do that. We'll have to do a kind." Of, Learning, again, this is the, another rule, learning from the petrochemical industry, process plant industry. They said, we'll do it, we'll have sections, prefabricated sections, and we'll screw them together effectively. And we'll jack them up in, as a, so that, you know, they can be done without having concrete. They also had, um, they, you know, they, they realized that they couldn't rely on cranes because there was only a five hour window at night when there were no aircraft. So they had to, again, there was another reason for doing this. But when they did it, it didn't work, fit together, so the sections didn't fit together. So normally, under the old adversarial situation, the client would say, that's your responsibility, you sort it out. It's, it, the client, they worked out it would cost about five million, and they would have ended up in court debating these issues. But this, for the client, is a bigger risk, because for the client, if that's delayed, that means they, they've, they've got one, there's one year of training for air traffic controllers. And there's a big fit out period with, for that. Uh, and it's regulated as well. So it would have delayed the opening of the airport. So if they went in under the old contractual approach, they would have ended up uh, delaying the airport. So the risk was the clients. You have to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and so they went, they used the T5 agreement. The teams got together, co-located, working in offices, finding out a solution. They found a solution. It was, it cost around, I think, something like two, an additional two million 
which is tiny when you think about the possible delay of the opening of the airport. Um, and actually they did it in a quite a period of time. And that was very much working, you know, using the uh, contractual approach, which was about, you know, when things happen, we have to deal with it and we have to collaborate and work together, to solve problems. Uh, and that's what they did. Um, so rule three, rehearsed for, rehearse first. Um, so it's not that you can't introduce new technology on a project, you can introduce new technology. But on these big projects, new technology often is what is a source of problems. Um, in the Jubilee line, they introduced a new, the world's most advanced signaling system, and that delayed the project. Um, in Swanet Air Traffic Control, they, in, they introduced the world's most advanced um, air traffic control system. Uh, they had a fixed price contract. That delayed the contract because when, it, when you're introducing new technology, there's always development periods, there's, risk, there's cycles that have to be done. And in these big projects, unless you've calculated for that properly, that can really have a significant effect on these projects. So before you introduce new technology, what we found from our, the people we were working with, what you do is identify the risks, explore options, prototype, prove, test, trial, and do all of these um, practices, off-sale trites, on-site tests, simulation. Many things can be done in simulation uh, and, um, uh, and other forms of uh, testing and trials. Um, okay, so there's three examples here. The, one, the first one is the roof. This is a very risky thing, so it's a new practice, 150 meter freestanding span roof. Uh, I'm not an engineer, so don't ask me any complicated questions. <laughs> um, uh, so they tested that, they, they said, we'll do this in sections, and they went up to Yorkshire, and they actually spent a million pounds testing this thing before they did it on site. Because if you imagine they did it on site and it went wrong, um, you'd have all these delays, all these problems. It was a congested site anyway. There was only one point of entrance. You know, they had to have just-in-time deliveries of supplies to get the, make this thing work. So they tested it off-site and they identified 140 lessons that they then brought into the, the project, which they, you know, uh, and then actually uh, made sure that they addressed them. Terminal 2. I don't know if many of you know it, but in the UK, Terminal 5 is famous not for being a brilliant project, which it is in the construction and the infrastructure world, but for most other people, it's famous for being the lost luggage. Again, <laughs> SAS. Um, we need their help, actually, probably. You know, I, I talked to them about them before. Um, uh, but what, I, what they said was, so Terminal 5 was only 12 days delay, and actually, compared to some airports, you know, you got six, Denver International Airport, I think was six months at least. The Hong Kong Airport was something like six months delay with software issues and all that. The, uh, when you integrated the baggage handling system into the thing, it just didn't work. And familiarization is a big, a big issue. People really matter. Uh, we do a lot of work now in, um, at UCL on, on the, what we call the back end, the opening of big projects. It's a, it's, a, it's a really significant and complex thing, especially when you're pulling together all of these systems and users, and you're bringing users in, and users have to be engaged in the whole process. It's very difficult to do. Um, terminal 2, they said, right, we're going to learn from Terminal 5, where we tried to open an airport in, as a big bang in one moment. Um, it was in the least busy time of year, but it was a real problem. Um, here, they said, we'll do it in progressively in stages. So they had 170 um, uh, proving trials. They had, 1, 000, I think, 1,800 um, users, passengers, coming in, volunteers, coming in to test it. They did a, 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 a test on the live flight. People arrived, they didn't know, but they were kind of, they were a test, you know, they ran through this um, terminal uh, in order to gather information to find out what would work. Uh, and, that, and that's really important. And the Olympics, their key lesson was from other Olympics, but also from Heathrow Terminal 5 is, we need to finish early. And so often with uh, Olympics and football um, events, you see the, the whole thing being constructed and, and frantically at the end last minute. Here they finished one year early so that they could test on live, on actually live events. So again, bring users in early and, and, and so that they can, they can do that. Um, okay, the, the fourth rule is calibrate the risks and the uncertainty uh, appropriately. So I've talked about these big projects um, and they've got multiple sub-projects, but these projects vary in, in um, uncertainty. Some are, more, are less risky, they're more predictable elements within a project, but some elements are kind of are very, very unpredictable. So, um, and this is unlike the T5 project. So in many other projects, you can actually have, you can decompose, you know, it's called targeted flexibility. So you say, well, what, how do we deal with the different degrees of uncertainty? We need different contracts, different approaches, diff to actually, you know, address this, you know. Remember the um, T5 being 
147 sub-projects and 16 major projects, you could have different contracts, different approaches for those different... So it's, it's, a, it's really about dealing with that. Um, um, and on the Olympics, they did that very carefully. They said, actually, they had a menu of contracts and associated approaches for dealing with the different levels of uncertainty. Uh, and on this side here, um, so this is the temporary venues and the broadcasting center. This was largely kind of standardized um, components, some of it reusable uh, um, uh, components and, and modular components. And they felt that actually these could be a fixed price. You know, we can transfer the risk. It's been done in the past. The learning's relatively straightforward. But on the other projects, what they decided to do was say, okay, with these projects, we're gonna have a different type of contract and a different approach. This was the, the velodrome here, which is the cycling track, and the aquatic center was still with the wings on it, which are now, you know, the Zaha Hadid um, architectural um, iconic building. Um, and so these were the more iconic, difficult, tr tricky elements of the, of the project. So they, they said we'll have a different approach for those. Um, and, um, one, and, and, one, and the way it worked was that that approach allowed them, for example, with the, um, the velodrome, they were originally gonna have steel structures and they said, actually, this is going to be, you know, we're getting price of steel's going up. There's a potential, um, uh, you know, uh, problems with delivery of steel. Uh, so the contractor, under that contractual arrangement, ISG, actually came up with an alternative solution and said, well, let's, let's use a cable net roof. Um, they had a change, it went to the change control board, which met very frequently. So they were actively involved. The sponsor was actively involved in the project. Uh, and um, they said, yes, we'll, we'll approve this. And they went ahead and they, um, they saved money, time, uh, and, you know, so the project was, you know, decomposed in this way and they had elements that they could, you know, bring in new ideas and it brought in new ideas. It was a way of bringing in new ideas again to the project. The fifth and final rule is um, harness innovation from start to finish. And this is where we really learn from Crossrail and my involvement in Crossrail as a project. Establish, with these big projects, establish an innovation structure, strategy for bringing innovation in. You've got a supply chain. You've got dozens of, you know, usually dozens of major contractors, often working in joint ventures, they have hundreds of subcontractors bringing in new ideas, potentially where these sources of ideas. Clients don't usually have the ideas. It's, the, it's, the, it's their supply chain. This is what the people in the industry tell us. Um, so we want to pull out those ideas from the supply chain. Um, and, you, and, and what they did was um, created a digital platform where people in the, in the project Sub submit good ideas, and I'll show you this in a minute, um, and they could evaluate whether those ideas were effective and would help to deliver the project more efficiently and effectively. So the, the innovation program was governed by the need to finish that project effectively and efficiently. It was subordinate to that. The overall objective was to get the project done and have an impact. Um, the, the innovation strategy was to bring those ideas in and support that. And what they did was they created a kind of an open innovation program. So an idea for, on this side would come in. Um, if it was already available, it'd just be shared across the program. Some ideas are just mature. They're proven. They can be used. Um, others uh, need a period of discovery. Um, and then there's a comp competitive entry where they develop the ideas. There was a kind of a, a governance structure which had uh, um, used experts within the project to evaluate, evaluate those ideas. Um, and the, the ideas that got supported would be taken forward and they would re receive funding to, to implement them within the project. And I'll show you some of those ideas in a moment. Uh, and within the first, um, this was the first in the world, by the way, it took a long time to get the teams into that kind of mindset and it helped them. Being innovative also helped them to be collaborative. It was a, it was a, a side um, a benefit from this. Um, but within the first, by just over a year, there were 800 ideas submitted. For improving for improvements to the project, and there were things like new materials, and I'll show you. I'll show you now. Uh, things like you know, it was a, this was a civil engineering project, right? So um, they a lot of the ideas were kind of obviously of, of that nature, low carbon concrete, and there were collaborations between different, uh, between sometimes with contractors and sometimes with research laboratories. Uh, sprayed concrete lining using uh, digital images, safety gloves. This was a, this seemed like a trivial thing, but. You know, in these big projects, there's a real issue of safety. And um, so they printed messages in different parts, with different times on the gloves, just so people would just continuously think safety through the project. Um, and some more. All of these came through the innovation program. Uh, and you can read, have a look at them. So obviously, they, they, they experimented with things that didn't quite work. The Google um, glasses, um, did, 
you know, they couldn't develop it in time to implement it on the project. They had some more radical things like using, extracting the heat from the tunnel to um, warm buildings adjacent along the route of the, of the Crossrail system uh, and things like that. Um, so we developed this innovation strategy and what we've seen since Crossrail is that the, the ideas moved on to the other big projects in the UK. So uh, Tideway is the new sewer system in the UK, 4.2 billion pound project. They have an innovation program. And in fact, Andy Mitchell, who was the pro pro program director on Crossrail, said, I, when I move on, he became chief executive of, of, of Thames Tideway. He said, I want to have an innovation program. On Hinkley Point C, they have an innovation program. On High Speed 2, that's the biggest project now in the UK, 42 billion. Estimates going up, upwards all the time, but uh, they have an innovation program uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and it's quite interesting. And so a lot of the team have moved on from from this um, and that's there's a digital platform so what's happened now is that Crossrail originally they, they created their own digital platform kind of hopper for putting ideas in that has now been used across the industry so the industry because they're public government projects and infrastructure projects they're all sharing that platform so this platform you can go and look at it yourselves they can share ideas so they are you know they've moved from one project to multiple projects where they're, they've got these kind of you know really embracing innovation as a as a an, an idea um, so um, that really um, summarizes um, what I wanted to say I just wanted to say that you know I think something interesting is happening or has happened and is still happening in the UK in mega projects um, it, it, you know there's a kind of new delivery model which is a complete shift from what had happened in the past where innovation the idea of recognizing that the uncertainty it will happen recognize it uh, and deal with it when it does happen and having the right structure. But recognizing the other side of uncertainty is the upside is opportunity. Opportunities will happen. In Crossrail, for example, the, um, when they designed the whole thing, the iPad didn't exist. Um, and then soon after the project was underway, they realized they could put the whole project on an iPad. So now everybody walking around the sites, 14,000 people, you know, workers, many of them, looking at the project on an iPad, something that they hadn't recognized at the beginning. So it's a pretty, pretty impactful thing. So I've been talking about these projects. They're large, they're complex. They are decomposed into smaller projects. Um, and, and the activity, the real activity, the real action uh, at that level is very much what we've been talking about today. So thank you very much.